the closing panel. Thank you. I like to think of us as the crowning He's panel, uh, the best for last. Um, my name is Peter Spiegel. I am the, the news editor of the Financial Times, uh, based in London. Uh, I, uh, have, it's my first time at the conference. I've done several dinners with Evo in Berlin and London. Uh, I think my job here is to prove that the Financial Times does actually hire Americans. Uh, so the Americans live in London, the Brits live in, live in the US. We have this all very screwed up. Um, well, thank you for hanging with us. I actually do think that this is the crowning panel, uh, because I must say, in the three days we've been here, in, in some of the sideline conversations and the dinners, the issue of cities and how they can play on the international arena has been one of these topics that's come up repeatedly, and they didn't even know I was doing this panel. Uh, I was told by, by Mike Nutter, Nutter that at the, the opening session with all the mayors um, on Wednesday morning, that this actually was one of the main topics discussed. Um, and obviously, that's because of the political situation uh, both here in the U.S., but also uh, internationally, where we have seen the interest of cities sometimes uh, overtaken or opposed by uh, national governments. And I think this has become a real uh, important topic to deal with. And, and frankly, I think the Chicago Council has been at the, at the forefront of dealing with these issues. So it's a very, it's a very timely uh, issue to discuss, and I'm glad we're, we're wrapping things up with it. I want to, in the panel discussion, I told them before we came out here, I, I think there are probably three policy issues where cities have begun to exert themselves on the international arena. The most obvious one uh, has been climate change here in the US, uh, given the opposition uh, by many uh, of the big cities to the Trump administration's decision to withdraw from Paris. Um, but there are other issues, I think, on, on an international level, particularly immigration, uh, which you've seen not only here in the US, where uh, because of the rush for talent, the, 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 the competition for talent, um, and the need to pull in talent from internationally, um, you've seen U.S. cities sort of, you know, uh, banging up against the, the administration on that. But that's happened in Europe as well. In the U.K., obviously, the Brexit debate was largely a, a, a fight over uh, immigration, uh, where London uh, was opposed to the rest of the country. I think you've seen that elsewhere in, in, in Europe and, and, you know, in, in Asia as well. Obviously, immigration's been a big issue in Australia as well. And the last one I want to throw out there is trade. Now, this hasn't yet really become a... A, a, a national issue uh, for cities or an international issue for cities. But if you think about it, um, all of our cities were started as trade hubs largely. Uh, our ports are still there, our warehouses are still there, our airports are still there. As the, the, worryingly, uh, our national governments are becoming more and more protectionist, I think on the global scene, cities are gonna have to step up and talk more about trade. Um, so those are the issues I, I wanna talk about with the panel. Um, but we had a couple of discussions on, on phone calls uh, before we, we came here, and I think there are two th sort of cross-cutting currents I want I to deal with. One is sort of the pragmatic. How do cities pragmatically get involved on the international scene? Because it's not something that's been done formally a whole lot in the past, and I think cities are now just trying to find their footing uh, in the international arena to, to have their voices heard and collectively have their voices heard. Uh, but then also, I'd like the panelists also to address the issue of, uh, as I sort of uh, said at the beginning, this tension that has developed between the urban and the non-urban. Um, because I think, as a narrative, I, I would argue, um, the issues that are matter to urban centers, be they immigration, globalization, uh, you know, uh, green policies, we are losing the national debate and in the international debate. What can cities do better to convince the non-urbans uh, that the issues that are important to the cities um, are important to the country as a whole. So those are sort of the, the, the topics I'm going to push on. Let me quickly, though, introduce our panel. Um, immediately to my left uh, is Eitan Schwartz. Eitan is, is CEO of an organization called Tel Aviv Global, um, which is aimed in this, 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 this global hunt for talent, uh, trying to attract innovators to, to Tel Aviv, but also has a background working for the mayor of Tel Aviv on these international issues, was sort of his, his international advisor uh, on, on international issues for the mayor of, of Tel Aviv. Lucy Trumbull. Trumbull is the chief commissioner for the Greater City Com uh, Sydney Commission, uh, which is an organization that looks at planning for, the, for the, the metropolitan area around Sydney, but also has a background in, in the private sector, uh, on the boards of some biotech, um, biomedical companies, so has a private sector background as well. Uh, Carla Sada. Um, right now is the Undersecretary for North America for the Secretary of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, but also former ambassador to the U.S. Uh, so on trade issues, perhaps, I can, I can hit you up on. Uh, uh, Nita Hachigian 
Uh, he's Deputy Mayor for International Affairs in Los Angeles. This is a newly created job to deal exactly with these kinds of issues. Um, also has a background in the federal government, uh, the State Department, and National Security Council, so also has uh, insight on how the, the relationship works uh, in Washington as well. And Donny Coderre is a former mayor of Montreal, also a former MP. Um, so again, has experience on the city level, has experience on the national a level. Friend, a friend to the United States. And a friend to the United we States. We didn't burn the White House. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are allies. We love you, okay? We love you too. Love you too. <laughs> <laughs> the, Brits, the Brits did what burn down the... I, I always celebrate July 4th by we, saying that uh, I am working for walls. the British oppressors. Okay. Um, but Dani also has worked for uh, an organization that pulls together uh, uh, cities from around the world, so also has a rather global view of this. Um, I warned Nina that I was going to start with her because, um, as I said in my introduction, this job of Deputy Mayor for International Affairs is new. Uh, and obviously California in general, but Los Angeles in particular, has tried to assert itself uh, after the Trump administration pulled out of Paris. And I just think it's very interesting that at this time, uh, Mayor Garcetti decided that this was a job that was necessary. So I just wonder, Nina, if you could just sort of take us through why the mayor decided to do this and, and just talk us through practically how you tried to become internationally focused in a municipal government. Sure, thank you. Um, well, Los Angeles is a incredibly global city. Uh, our residents are right under 40% foreign born. Um, we have some of the hugest diaspora populations of at least 20 countries of anywhere else uh, other than their home country. Um, we have 100 consulates. We have the fourth busiest airport. We have uh, the most uh, active port uh, complex in the Western Hemisphere. We were the creative capital. We have the Olympics coming. Uh, we have lots of FDI, foreign direct investment in our city that's changing our skyline. Um, and we're part of a number of uh, global networks, including the C40 and 100 Resilient Cities and the Safe City Network and others. And I think what, what the mayor thought was that we needed a team uh, and a point person to pull this all together so that we are making sure that we're uh, you know, doing the best by Angelinos uh, in coordinating a little bit some of, some of all this effort. Um, and on climate, uh, he, the mayor's really been very uh, out in front. He's the vice chair of the C40 uh, group of mega cities. Uh, he's also the founder of the Climate Mayors uh, in the United States, which is 400 now, over 400 mayors that have decided to, uh, to continue to abide by their Paris Treaty um, commitments. And he just yesterday, you know, while, while, Trump, while President Trump was in a Twitter war with our, with our allies and skipping the G7 climate uh, conversation this morning, he, uh, Mayor Garcetti, announced uh, a really very ambitious new target that Los Angeles will be carbon neutral um, by 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we, we can't help but being a global city. It's, it's our very people are themselves global and we have you know, so many uh, global ties. Uh, we want to make sure that we are being a good international player, that we are sharing our experience and learning from other cities, um, and that we're also delivering value to people in Los Angeles, whether it's jobs from foreign direct investment or from tourism or from trade um, or opportunities to travel that, that some of our low-income uh, communities have never had before that we're trying to start to provide. Um, to educational experiences, uh, cultural experiences. We have King, we're, we're very honored to be the first city outside of Egypt to have the new King Tut uh, exhibit, for example. So um, on the culture side, too, we're very active. And we had a big um, uh, show of, uh, called LALA, LA, Latino art um, and Latin American art um, in our city uh, last year. So anyway, all of these international things, and we want to make sure they're benefiting uh, Los Angeles. Can I ask you to push a little bit on the issue of, of the green commitments? Because again, to try to be pragmatic about this, yeah. how does a city convince, uh, play a role internationally to affect change on that? Is it interaction with companies, the car companies? Is it with construction companies as you build buildings? I mean, how does actually a city affect change in a global level when you are relatively geographically limited? Yeah, so well, we have a chief sustainability officer and we have a plan to do it and it's kind of across the board. So we are the number one solar city, so it's, it's um, installing solar. It's um, electric vehicles. We have one of the largest urban uh, electric vehicle fleets, and we're going to roll out um, new electric buses. We we have the best. We have the highest number of building uh, buildings that have a energy star efficiency uh, standard. 
Um, so it's really, you know, it's 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 everything. It's and uh, and it's it's a shared responsibility across the entire city, all the departments. And we have a very active Department of Water and Power that really is pushing to get to um, the highest number of renewables it can, or the highest percentage of renewables that uh, that delivers power to the residents. So, Aton, let me turn to you because in, in the conversation we had in the green room before this. The dynamic between the mayor of Tel Aviv and the national government is, is actually, we're saying, quite different. Now, the, the mayor is one of the last remaining uh, labor stalwarts, and obviously the government has been the coup for many years now. But you were saying that, that you try, unlike perhaps some of the, the localities here in, in, in the U.S. and California in particular, to, shall we say, work, work more in harmony with the national government, even though you're political opponents. Can you talk a bit about how you see the role of cities in dealing with the national government in that regard? It's a very interesting question because, as you said, you know, every mayor, uh, I assume that we all work for, we have been, uh, in the case of uh, Coder, they might have their differences with the national government, and, and that's part of politics. But when it comes to national uh, diplomacy, the directive and the sentiment of the mayor is we will always side with the national government. So you all know of the decision of Tre President Trump uh, to move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Tel Aviv is the only city in the world which is the non-capital, which, which is home to all the embassies uh, for political reasons. And the first person to applaud that was the mayor of Tel Aviv. So while we might have uh, an, ego, uh, an egocentric uh, uh, benefit from having a diplomatic core in our city, and which, which, which mayor doesn't want a large diplomatic core in his city, uh, Jerusalem is the capital. And he says to every ambassador walking into his office, I'll tell you two things, which I say to every ambassador. A, you're my resident, so welcome. Whatever you need, we're at your disposal. But B, we the Jews have a prayer in the Passover Seder, which is next year in Jerusalem. Before being the mayor of Tel Aviv, I'm an Israeli and I'm a patriot. And the fact that your embassy here in my city, quite frankly, is a disgrace. You would not allow the Israeli embassy to be in Chicago. You decide your capital, and we do the same as Israelis. So it's a very, very interesting dynamic. Um, the global outreach of Tel Aviv is a very, very important component of our policy. The ties we have with cities, um, mainly on issues of exchange of knowledge and best practices, is of huge benefit to the city. That's really where we try to put our main focus. Uh, the exchange of ideas is something that is extremely important for the development of the city. And when we find these mutual interests with cities all over the world, we really work hard on those. Uh, and just as Nina is deputy mayor, the mayor of Tel Aviv has an international affairs advisor. I used to have that position. Uh, he doesn't have an economic advisor. So I think that shows you the, the dynamic or the magnitude of diplomatic activities that we carry out from City Hall. Again, as Nina said, as insofar as it benefits the residents of the city. Well, let me ask you how, how this works again pragmatically, because if you are in general supportive of the national government on, on foreign policy, it would seem to me hard to dis distinguish yourself as a city on the international stage if you're always sort of in the, in the wake of the national government. You say it, it's more exchange of ideas, maybe you put a little meat in that bones. I mean, how does a city distinguish itself on the international stage if it, if it agrees to work so closely with the national government? Well, it's really the character of the city, I think, that's our, our global appeal. Uh, just a few hours ago ended our annual gay pride which attracted this year 250,000 people. Now, I know the one in Chicago attracts a million, so it's not the largest gay pride. There's something, I think, uh, that resonates in our region louder than it resonates in other parts of the world. It's not self-evident to have 250,000 people march in the Middle East uh, the way they do in other parts of the world. So I think it's the nature of the city that appeals to people. And also in our conversations, we talked about the fact that, indeed, this notion of progressive mayors, as opposed to a more national government, is not only apparent here in the United States, you see this all across of Europe. So there's a global phenomenon of a progressive voter and a progressive mayor in the cities. And there's this, I find when our mayor meets his counterparts from London or from Paris or from Berlin, who are all members of their respective labor parties, which in the United States you would call them Democrats, there's a certain solidarity of the cities being these bastions of progressive values. And when it comes to relations between cities, that also plays a role. Let me turn to, to, to you, Lucy, because um, in this issue of how states rely and work with national governments, I think you're rather uniquely positioned. I think you work very closely with the prime minister, if I'm not mistaken. I, I do. Yes. I even live with him. <laughs> yes, well, you even live with him, yes. Uh, so obviously Malcolm Turnbull <laughs> is, is the prime minister of Australia. Um, let me talk to you about the having seen it, obviously, from, from both perspectives, 
how cities do distinguish themselves from the national government, should they be distinguishing themselves from the national government, and how they find their role in an international level when obviously a country like Australia, you know, a G20 country, has its own presence on the international yeah. stage? Well, nations, nations are the principal vehicle for international relations because they're, they're, ever since you know, the 17th century, that's been the principal vehicle for diplomacy. But um, we're sort of going back to where we were with Florence and Siena and the uh, Hanseatic states as well, and that's being overlaid on the inter on the international in the international diplomacy framework. So cities are, I think, projecting and advocating and expressing their own values and their own uh, specialness, if you like, in order to attract talent. You know, uh, cities are all about talent attraction and retention to attract business and to also attract, let's be honest, tourists. And say, for example, Sydney has 75,000 foreign students studying at university. So, you know, cities are all about projecting themselves into the world, world arena to, to do well by the city. So I don't see them as being inconsistent, but I think the capacity for them to do so is optimised where there is a, a strong relationship either with the national government and or in a, in a federal system like you have in the US and as in the case in Canada, with the state government. It's really hard to do it in terms of world policy areas like national migration, climate ch addressing climate change, unless you have alignment, certainly in an Australian context, with at least the state government and optimally with the state and federal government as well. You get a lot more done. The, what would you say, because obviously immigration's been a big issue in Australia, and, and, and frankly a lot of, of countries in, in Europe have tried to model their, their immigration systems based on some of the Australian rules, but how would you advise a city then that is, that is trying to fight for talent and may have opposing views on immigration from the national government? Because I think what we've seen in the UK, certainly post-Brexit in, in the US, uh, is foreign students are no longer coming here in the numbers they were because they don't feel welcome. That is hugely problematic for cities that actually need that talent pool in, in the international competition for, for, for talent. How would you say a city should respond if a national government is, is working against their interests in that, in that regard? Well, you can't do it on, no city can do it on their own because at the end of the day, the national government will give a visa or not. So that's what I'm saying is the city cannot actually recruit international students, for example, if they're not allowed to come into the country. So that's why partnership is the best alternative. And I think, I think it's challenging if people don't get visas or apply for visas for various you know, geopolitical reasons. That's a really hard one to overcome. Denis, let me, let me turn to you, because I'm, I'm very struck by Lucy's uh, argument that the age of sort of Florence and, and, and Siena and the Hanseatic lead, that we're returning somewhat to that. Now, you obviously, as I said in your introduction, not only former mayor of Montreal, but have worked uh, with, with mayors all over as part of the, the Metropolitan uh, Organization. Um, tell me a little bit about whether you agree with that, and if so, how your organization, or how, how can we formalize this in, so that city-states, or whatever you want to call it, can coordinate there, their, their policies. There's a great president who said, yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the issue here is, there's three statements first. By 2030, over 70% of the population will be in cities. Two, cities were created before states. And, and three, we are not just a creature, we are a level of government. So, or we are a counterbalance, or we're a part of the solution. It doesn't mean we're the enemies of other national uh, level. I've been immigration minister after 9-11 Canada. There is issues with migration right now. We can agree or disagree in certain policy, but the reality is that uh, to welcome people or to integrate them, it will be the city that will be stuck with it, the situation. So I was there with Eric, uh, Ram, and Bill, like in Los Angeles, Chicago, and, and New York, when we spoke about the sanctuary city. So Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver did the same thing, and we're saying that migration, diversity is an asset. We did totally disagree with the way that at the national level we were talking in the United States about immigration. Same thing in Europe. Now, the difference in Canada with migration, in Europe, migration is illegal migration. In Canada, migra immigration means citizenship, so you have to be really careful. We've been there for the right to exist to Israel, and Ronald I participate in our organization, too. So we can work, and you said that those issues, climate change, trade, 
uh, but also when there's a situation, you need some friends to make sure that we are that counterbalance because we are clearly an insurance for citizens. We, the cities w will be there. So it, you can be an asset or you can be a burden, depends of the human nature of the individuals who have the power. But clearly, I think that uh, <laughs> you have no choice. The future lies with cities because you don't define the world through countries and continent anymore. You're, you define the world through cities. And, you know, cities are a formidable laboratory where you have the worst challenges, the, the worst problems, and the best solutions. So at one point, we live in a global world, and we're all working together. I know that there was some issue with Israel, and Canada was there, and through the cities we've been helping. We had the trade mission with, uh, in Israel, and instead uh, of having mayors who were fighting to each other, the mayor of Toronto, my friend John Torre and myself, went together. We had an asset, and uh, it, it, it was an added value. We have, of course, an, uh, issues regarding the, uh, with Mexico, United States, and Canada. The cities are there with, for example, at that time it was Mancera. We've been all working. So we are a political uh, player. And uh, it's not saying that, oh, by the way, we don't have the jurisdiction, don't take care of it. Que sera, sera. I mean, we, if, <laughs> we, if we believe uh, what's good for our citizen, uh, instead of looking like we're having a fight with national governments, well, no, we can, we can all work together. Justin Trudeau and the cities are working really, really well in, in Canada. Same thing uh, in France. As a matter of fact, Emmanuel Macron appointed his number two was uh, Gérard Collomb, the Minister of Interior, who's uh, mayor of Lyon, the second biggest city in, in France. So clearly sometimes we say things that maybe not please some other level of government, but we are connected with the people. Last but not least, my friend from Calgary, the mayor of Calgary, used to say in Canada, if you close the Parliament of Canada, you will notice it in three weeks. <laughs> if you close the, uh, the Parliament of your province, it will take about five days. Try to close your city hall. You'll have an immediate <laughs> reaction. So that's the role of cities for politically. But let me ask you to respond to Lucy's point, which is it's all well and good to say cities need to push and to advocate on, on particularly on the immigration issue, but if you don't have a partnership with the federal government, you know, it is the federal government that actually issues visas and sets immigration policy. You want to bet? Well, respond to that, yeah. <laughs> we, we'll no, no, I mean, it all depends. I mean, if, if we bow, okay, but if we're considered as a level of government and players, we are an asset. Of course, there will always be tension. That's the nature of the beast. And maybe we can agree to disagree. But uh, what Ethan said was really important. For the sake of Israel, let's work. So for the sake of the global objectives, for the sake of our own countries, no matter which uh, situation, for culture, name it, any topic, I think that we can play a role. Now, you know, you cannot talk about climate ch Now climate change take everything. You cannot talk about economic development without social development and sustainable development. So clearly, it, it's a large agenda. So. It means that we'll have the cities will take care of his business, and it's everybody's business, and it's all that global approach that we cannot work in silos anymore. So we, we are truly part of that solution. And that's why through Metropolis, through C40, we've been very active. And uh, then, you know, it's Think Global, Act Local. Kudos to Eric regarding the, the climate change group. But we've done that for the trade issue. We've done that to many, many issues. and. Uh, uh, you're stuck with us. And you have to work with us. And we're willing to, to be a player and, and uh, be an asset. Carlos, let me turn to you. We've talked a lot about environmental issues. We've talked about immigration issues. I apologize to put you on the spot on, on, on the last of my, my policies, but I think you were a good person to talk about trade, um, given, obviously, tensions with the U.S. over trade right now. Um, but it is cities in both countries, the U.S. and, and Mexico, which will be hit hardest if this does turn into some sort of trade war. Again, to repeat myself slightly, you know, it is the ports that are in the cities, it is the airports that are in the cities, it is, this is where trade happens. And you were saying before we came on that you actually spend a lot of time when you go to the U.S. meeting with mayors because you do actually see them as an advocate there. Can you talk a bit about that? Of course. First of all, thank you, Peter. Pleasure to be participating in this uh, unique panel. Let, let, let me tell you that uh, the situation in Mexico and the U.S. is also unique uh, because uh, there is a community of uh, 35 million 
Mexican and Mexican Americans, out of which 23 are Mexican Americans. But there is 12 million, 12 million that were born in Mexico. Out of them, half of them are legal residents, and uh, it is six million that are uh, undocumented guy, even though there is a lot of focus on that. I perhaps come back to uh, immigration later on. But uh, yes, what is uh, the strategy of Mexico nowadays? All of a sudden, the panorama changed for Mexico because of a new person at the White House. And uh, we have to adapt what to do in order to continue evolving in this unique relationship that has been a coin for the last uh, at least 25, uh, 30 years in the modern times. And uh, what uh, we are doing is opening the spectrum and not concentrating just in the White House. Yes, in the White House, but uh, with Mr. Kelly or with uh, Kushner, which is the person in charge of the relationship with, uh, with Mexico. But what uh, uh, governors and the mayors are doing, and it is also my role myself, to go and visit as many cities as possible. And uh, I can count you uh, right now how many cities I have visited with mayors, and uh, what is the role that mayors are playing, because it is on their own interest. I can tell you that yesterday I was a governor of Illinois, and uh, uh, he was asking me, what is your role here? And I said, well, my role is to let you know what is at stake, what might happen if uh, there is no deal on NAFTA. Uh, from there, I go to the different uh, localities, and I can tell you we were recently with mayor of LA. Not only myself, it is at the highest level of the cabinet members of uh, Mexico, Secretary of Foreign Affairs was there. And uh, in Mexico, we're receiving mayors of uh, Montreal and mayors of uh, Vancouver and mayors of uh, Calgary. So we understand that the role of uh, local players, it is fundamental. I do not forget at all that uh, the uh, motto of uh, all politics is local in the United States. It is very true. But you need to leave it in order to understand it. In my case, I was, uh, I was a mayor of my hometown, Oaxaca, but I was consul general of Mexico in LA and in San Antonio, and in Toronto, and in New York, and I was based in Washington DC twice. So my perspective, I think, it is so important in order to continue with this relationship, including, very importantly so, the governors and the mayors. I have visited, perhaps I have had conversations with 20, 23 governors in the, in, the, in the United States, and perhaps 45 uh, mayors of uh, different political spectrum. So the same is true when uh, I visited uh, uh, the governor of uh, Wisconsin. That at the beginning there was a reluctancy of uh, having an approach with Mexico. And then all of a sudden they sent a letter to our president in order for us to open another consulate where? Another consulate in uh, Milwaukee. And it is the 50th consulate. And uh, we were so welcome there. And uh, Mr. Walker, who is the governor of Wisconsin, is a kind of conservative guy. But uh, the interest of Wisconsin, of Wisconsin, it is with Mexico. And the interest of Milwaukee, it is also with Mexico. So I can put you tons of examples of how many contacts we have had and how the relationship that exists right now between Mexico and the United States, it is in very important part because of the role of governors, because of the role of uh, mayors, and because of the role of local forces that participate in this unique relationship that exists between Mexico and the US. Let me ask you one more question before I turn it for, uh, for questions. I want to leave at least 20 minutes or so for Q&A from the, from the floor. So I'm coming to you very <laughs> quickly. But can I ask you about, you, you talked about the number of contexts you have, but maybe we can pull the immigration issue in here as well. Have you been able, again, to try to stay pragmatic about it, have you been able to find ways that the Mexican government and these city governments can actually either lessen or, or find ways to solve problems of either supply chains or immigration issues that the city can work with Mexico as opposed, maybe not as opposed to, but to try to create some space where the federal government has been more contentious? I mean, have you been able to do that? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, there is a good uh, uh, example of uh, 
New Haven in Connecticut. They started like uh, 15 years to issue a special IDs for all immigrants that were in the city. And then it was followed by New York. And uh, now Chicago, you know, the city key. It is an example of how the immigrants are welcome, no matter what, no matter what is your, your, your status. That is one point. But on the other hand, there is different alternatives that the cities are taking. Either call it welcoming cities, or uh, friendly cities, or sanctuary cities. It, it doesn't matter. What the, uh, the, the intention of these policies is to let immigrants know that they are welcome in, in the city. And that changes a lot. If, uh, let's say, Arizona, which used to be a very anti-immigrant uh, state, now with a, a, a new governor, well, not, not new, but uh, he's for election, and uh, with the four major cities of uh, Arizona, Nogales, Scottsdale, Tucson, and uh, Phoenix, all of them are following uh, the, the, the path of welcoming immigrants. Why so? Because they understand what is the role that they are playing. Not only that, now Phoenix, Phoenix City has two trade offices in Mexico, one in Mexico City and one in uh, Sonora, in, the state, in Hermosillo. So those are very practical, realistic situations of what is happening, no matter what is happening at the top level. But uh, the rest of the political and economic actors are participating every single day, more so and so. I always said the best things in America come out, come out of Phoenix, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let me open it to the floor here, um, and there are, as, as you know, uh, microphones around. If you could identify yourself, and if you have a specific question for a member of the panel, please identify it. Otherwise, I will be picking a member of the panel. I see one right here in the front at my left, your right. Let's see. Hi, uh, Gabriel Pagny, Urban Planner. Um, diplomacy is a two-way phenomenon. You open the doors to expand your knowledge, but you also open the door to Thousands of immigrants are coming, uh, highly qualified, are coming to the cities today. And we are kind of not considering that because we're putting them in a huge bunch of immigrants. We can tap that. What are cities doing? Many of these immigrants are ending being cab drivers. Many of them are working in restaurants. But they're highly skilled professionals. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah. the how can yeah. cities tap on that? Uh, knowledge and kind of boost and integrate that level of professionals that are integrated into cities. Let me, let me start with Eitan on this, and, and I can, anyone else in the panel wants to address it, because obviously, Eitan, your day job is basically trying to do this, bring in innovators and talent from abroad into Israel. I mean, how do you deal with this issue? Because again, frankly, in the last 10 years, Israel has also been a, a huge net importer of immigrants, mostly from Russia, but, but that issue of integration is a real important one. How, can you address that first? Yes. Um, in the case of Tel Aviv, one of the things we've been trying to promote unsuccessfully is for the Israeli government to allow foreigners to work in our high-tech sector. We have a thriving high-tech sector. It's a fantastic phenomenon of the city. But the Israeli market does not produce enough talent uh, uh, to meet the demand. And several appeals on behalf of the mayor and other players in this field to allow more influx of foreign talent into Israel did not succeed. And I think one of the reasons is we probably were unsuccessful to convince that this is something that would benefit the whole of Israel. Israel considers immigration something that should be limited. And unless we manage to break through that, this would be perceived as a local Tel Aviv interest, but might be in contradiction to the national interest. So really, the, the, the question is, how does Israel as a whole benefit from that? And we did not succeed in that field. So therefore, we have a shortage of people. We know people want to come work. Obviously, this is the type of qualified professional that every city would want, but because of our national regulation, we are unable to allow these people to work legally in Israel, thus in the city of Tel Aviv. Nina, do you want to address it? Because obviously this became a, a big issue, again, with a lot of the immigration policies the administration has, has, has uh, implemented. And you saw one of the leading voices, particularly on H-1B visas and whatnot, has been California tech companies, because similarly, they need these people to show up and come to California, to come to mostly Northern California, but also Southern California. Can you talk a bit about that same issue, about how you are able to attract the best talent integrated in an, in an environment where it does seem the national government is, is pushing the other direction? Sure. Uh, just one note before I address that, which is that, just to be clear, I mean, the three issues you picked, uh, climate, trade, and immigration, are all 
places where the city has real differences with the federal government. But at the same time, uh, and just to address your concern about you know uh, working with the national government, we do work with them on law enforcement, on you know promoting small businesses, all all the things where we still align. Um, uh, but in terms of immigration, so uh, you know. It, Obviously, we don't issue visas, so there's not much we can do in terms of the number of, of that are allowed in. We can use the mayor's collective voice to address immigration, which we've done. We've done it on DACA. Uh, just yesterday, uh, the mayor sent a letter with three other um, cities, Albuquerque, Houston, uh, and, uh, and, one, and Tucson, uh, protesting the policy of, of taking uh, children away from their parents' arms uh, at the border, which is so horrifying, um, and uh, and we're and there's a movement on as well to to have mayors also um, weigh in on the H1B v, H1B v, v is, visa issue, um, but we uh, you know we rely on immigration and we we, we rely on uh, on immigrants to be they are fueling innovation in our city like they're fueling it you know across the country so. Um, we welcome them. We, uh, you know, we have uh, a, a the mayor's established a legal fund for those who are being deported and don't have uh, legal assistance, for example. And we have many, many programs to to help integrate uh, uh, immigrants into our city. Carlos, you put your hand up. Did you want to? Do uh, yes. Uh, regarding the H one B visas, I don't know who who, who asked that. Okay, um, you, you move. Uh, there is a policy in Mexico that goes to the state and even. A, a cities like uh, Guadalajara and Monterrey, that uh, if the guys that are here that uh, are not accepted with H-1B business, they are welcome to Mexico. And there is a special promotion, so there is a talent that it is there, so we should take advantage of that. So if you see the pages of some of these, again, the role of cities and the role of the states are fundamental. But the same is true with uh, the DACAs. The DACAs, it is a universe of 800,000 guys. 600,000 of them are of Mexican origin. If you, uh, if you have ever met a DACA guy, they are the most talented guys. So our Secretary of Foreign Affairs keeps saying, well, if uh, you do not uh, give an option uh, to the DACAs, of course, they are welcome to Mexico. It will be the largest ever transfer of talent from one country to the other because they are prepared already. And Canada is also kind of saying, here we are. These are guys that speak English, that know how to move around, and that they, they, they have a, a lot of uh, talent because they are trained in different areas. So this is something that is very important to follow because that's a very realistic situation that is on the move. Lucy, I wonder if I can ask you to address this too because we talked again before we came on that, that Australia under Prime Minister Howard did actually implement some pretty tough immigration uh, laws, but did try to, with bipartisan support, as you noted, try to gradate it, I guess is the, if that's the word, um, for a point system that does allow yeah. high talented people to come in. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about, given it's been, gosh, almost 15 years now, I guess, since yeah. those, those are policies, have you seen any change on the ability to track some of these high power, uh, talented uh, uh, foreigners and integrate them as a result of some of the immigration laws? Um, attracting them is not a problem and, gen you know, as a, as a general proposition, people who are highly qualified and highly skilled adapt pretty easily. I mean, where, where our office is for the Greater Sydney Commission in Parramatta, which is in the ge geographic centre of, of Sydney, about, you know, 25 kilometres from where the, harbour, where the harbour and the opera house are, um, you, I can actually see the demographic profile changing, you know, when I get the train to work, you know, the, and, and back to and, you know, gen, generally move around. There is a huge increase in the amount of South Asians living in that part of Sydney. Now, not all, um, and, and they are typically, you know, either students or they often work in the IT industry, etc. We have a, a very, very, um, I think, successful skilled migration program. And I think it's been working. They tweak what the relevant skills are, but but, and, and they're recalibrated from time to time. But, you know, we are actually, we actually have um, nationally, I think about 170 or 180,000 migrants and they, a year, and they come typically to large cities like Sydney and Melbourne where there are large economic opportunities and jobs, jobs for them. So um, that works really well. And, you know, there's a humanitarian program which is um, quite, you know, sort of um, 
you know, focused on, on, you know, sort of in the Syrian crisis about 17, typically about 12 to 14,000 people a year. So we have, we have a calibrated immigration policy, which I think works really well. It does mean, however, that our population growth rate in Sydney is on the higher end of the scale. It's like 1.5 to 2%. Now, I suspect what might happen is what's been happening in New York, the high population growth rate might flatten out a bit because of a relatively low housing affordability in the large cities. And I'm actually, my, my sort of non-empirical, um, my anecdotal, uh, I guess, impression is that more young kids are moving to regional cities where they've got, um, where there's an opportunity of housing and, and, and lots of school shortages, especially in health, education, et cetera. So there, there is that, you know, sort of uh, that, that internal migration might be shifting a little bit. So, you know, for the most part, I think, I think we do it pretty well. And um, obviously there are always challenges as there are in any country where people come from countries with very little linguistic um, or cultural familiarity. And that's always a bit of a challenge and, and we work on it and we do our very best. But we are, I think, one of the great international multicultural success stories, mostly in our cities, because that's where most of the migrants come. I think that we have to be, uh, we have to understand each other about the wording too, because you have immigration, you have refugees, uh, when we're, and, and diversity is an asset. I mean, uh, besides the First Nation, of course, we are a land of immigration of immigrants, we're a son or a sister of, a son or, or, or daughter of, of immigrants. Uh, so that's one point, to, to be a magnet, because for economic reason, for growth, immigration is, is clearly important because you will all witness a shortage of qualified workers. That's point number one. On the issue of integration, well, of course, we have to work with the professional association to deliver the diploma or the recognition of the credential. Sometimes that's the problem. I mean, I used to joke, and it's a bad one, that I want to be sick in a, in a taxi because the cab driver is a, a doctor who's not recognized. <laughs> that's a problem. But, I, but at the same time, I think that more and more other level of government has been focusing on the credential itself. Now, when we talk about refugee or the migration, I, I, I was privilege to negotiate the safe third agreement with the United States at that time to regularize the movement of people. Of course, there's always a situation of safety. We don't accept everybody. We need to make sure that the people who are coming are coming for the, the right reason. And then we can talk about integration because we are, we signed the Geneva Convention and all the people who are coming deserve to have a process, except if there's some criminal record, we, we change the legislation at that time to put people aside. But I think that it's everybody's business. That's the reason why I've been saying, and I conclude with that, when I said the difference between welcoming people and integrate them. The integration will go no matter what through cities. So uh, I kind of salute because they have the power to do so. Some of the cities in the United States regarding the, 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 the sanctuary cities. But uh, I think that from a business perspective, universities, students, all that, I think that uh, the time has come to have an international treaty where we can understand each other about uh, the framework of uh, that kind of integration to recognize the credentials. We have time probably for one more question if I see anyone out there. I would just say, as I always call myself a non-EU migrant worker I in the UK. Yeah. Um, I have problems integrating myself because of the, the language barrier. Um, let's, I, yeah, right over here, can I, uh, can I make this the last one? Again. Guy Shanif from Tel Aviv University. Um, you started the session, you, you had a comment about the growing disparities between global cities and the rest of the country. And then the session drifted on to talk about the disparities between global cities and the national state and the government, which is, of course, important. But on all these issues, immigration, environment policies, trade policies, you have political divisions between global cities and other more local, small localities. So my question is, how and should cities attend this growing disparity, which is cultural, political, uh, and of course economical between global cities and the rest of the country? Can I have a stab at that? Yeah, please, listen. Well, that, that, to, that is one of the most fascinating things about the emergence of this global city movement, and you could actually make a pretty good case that we are sitting here in the middle of a group of globally elite, pretty mobile people, and the FT is kind of like the newspaper for, for us, right? 
So That's let's right. be honest about that. But I think that we have to be well aware that the quality of the dis conversation and discourse between the global cities and the non-global world could definitely improve. And you know, in, in, in with the rise of popula populism in, in, in lots of different countries, I think we have to be acutely aware and engage with and listen to their concerns. Otherwise, we will look like um, pretty, a pretty self-satisfied lot if we don't talk and, and engage with the people who are outside the global cities and also with the people inside the global cities who don't feel like they're part of the success story. And our civilization, our global civilization, depends on that discourse and that conversation and that civility. It's a very important point. Denny, I saw your hand up. Do you very, want to very shortly. I, I, I agree with Lucy. But what we need to be careful, divide to conquer. We don't want to play other people's game like in their, it's in their interest that the city splits among themselves or municipalities. And that's why local government has also to be vigilant to stick together. We have an agenda that we push forward called the Living Together in Montreal. We had a declaration of Montreal. We create an observatory, an international observatory, where universities and cities all working together and sharing the best practices. I think that's important. What's the, li the Living Together agenda? It's a balanced approach between openness and vigilance. So you have openness regarding the values, vigilance, you know, there are some bad seeds too that we have to take care of. So the agenda of vigilance is important, public safety and all that, but the balance too. And we have to make sure that it's not just a political thing. It's not just a politician or cities or national governments. It's the civil society, it's everybody, universities, uh, the academics. So we can all work together and focus on a common agenda to enhance quality of life because as Ban Ki-moon said, there's no plan B to the planet. So all those issues that we're talking is to make sure that we have a better place to, to, to be, a better life to live, and uh, provide instead of reacting all the time, putting up forward those prevention agenda to prevent now we, are, we can't afford that we, because if we're not doing it, the worst can happen. Hey, Tom, let me give you the last word. We're at zero time, so I'll give you very start quickly. Just to, point out, yeah. <laughs> just to point out to a practice uh, done by the city of Barcelona, which I find very fascinating, their uh, division of international affairs has a fund funded by the city council in Barcelona where they do projects and exchanges with 10 cities in the developing world. And I, I think what they're trying to say is with global prosperity comes a global responsibility not only for nations, but also for cities. So a city like Barcelona, which is experiencing global prosperity, also has a, a, a one eye on, on other cities and seeing what they can be doing with, 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 the, with the other type of cities, as, uh, as this gentleman indicated. Well, look, I think this has been incredibly interesting. And I think, as Lucy pointed out at the, at the very start, unlike many, many of the panels that we've had over the last three days, this is something that's new. We were returning to an era where the city-state is becoming an international actor. And as a result, you know, like, like Siena and Florence was before, uh, as a result, I think this is something that, as a journalist, I think we want to keep a close eye on uh, cities as an international actor. And I think as these council meetings uh, go on, I think it's something that's going to become more and more important. So that said, can we please thank the panel, I think, for an excellent discussion. Thank you.